to the late Mark uh, Oliver Gewaltig from the Human Brain Project uh, give his commentary. Um, okay, Mark, uh, Oliver, please uh, let us know what you think. <laughs> okay, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for this interesting talk. And um, I made a couple of uh, uh, comments or notes here to, to Alan Winfield's talk. And I think um, the, the problem is really about uh, what I what I mentioned earlier in the in my comment, namely that we have these different phases. Yeah, so we have the research phase, and we have a product development stage, and we have a product deployment stage. And at each stage, we have to apply different standards and different, um, let's say, uh, ethical uh, marks. And at the same time, what we've seen in Alan's talk also is that for every ethical rule, there are typically people that would like to have an exemption, like we shouldn't build killing robots except for national security, which means, okay, let's build killing robots. Yeah, this is the typical excuse that everybody uh, injects in, into these sentences. Yeah, so building a killing robot to start with that, that is a product choice. Yeah, it's, there is no research on, I mean, everybody knows how to kill a human, right? And then putting the things together to have a killing robot, that's a, an engineering choice. And there, I guess, the ethical instruments, in my view, would be where's the funding and what are the, the steps to go through. But in the end, when it comes to defense, there's always institutes like DARPA who come with the argument, and I had this discussion on the IRIS conference last week, and they say, well, is it better to have a machine destroyed or our boys? Mm -hmm. And then the discussion is typically over. So I think this is a very difficult issue, and I'm not, I doubt that we will, um, that we will get around killing robots as much as we got around uh, biological warfare or nuclear weapons. They will happen, and there is no, um, there's nothing that will stop it because ultimately it is the totalitarian regimes that will drive them uh, if all the Western or the, all the democratic uh, governments uh, outlaw them. Yeah? And then it's, uh, it's an arms race in the end. Yeah? But I think the more, the more difficult problem in all this uh, robot ethics discussion is what is a robot anyway? Yeah? So if you look at Wikipedia, it defines a robot as a mechanical or virtual artificial agent, usually an electromagnetic, uh, electromechanical machine that is guided by a computer program or an electronic circuitry. Now, if you take away the agent, a washing machine would be a robot. Yeah, and now the, basically the definition is again outsourced uh, or, or transferred to the word agent because an agent for me typically is something that can move uh, in space, and but we have a lot of stationary robots, yeah. And is it something that can perceive something in some way and then react? And in here we are back at steep landmines, which would, in that case, uh, also qualify uh, as a as a um, as a robot. Yeah. When we say, well, it's just a device, it's just a booby trap, in the end. So I think the definition of robot is already very difficult. And then we are back at the question is what types of machines can we build? And um, here, I think it's also interesting to note that there is a very, very big difference between Western culture and Asian culture when it comes to building or the ethics of building machines. And in particular, the last point that Alan mentioned, the, the um, mimicry of humans. So, um, in Western culture, we are typically influenced by Christian beliefs, and we are made after the the or after the image of God. And building somebody who looks like humans is making is violating one of our commandments. Yeah? Whereas the Asians don't have this problem. For them, robots are typically positively uh, pictured. Yeah? They don't have the fear that Western cultures have. In, in, from from robots, and I think the same applies to artificial intelligence. We like to, the Western culture likes to point out the science fiction horror scenarios um, 
whereas uh, in, in the Asian cultures, you see more the positive scenarios. So it's, it's again, very difficult to, if not impossible, to, to come up with a generally accepted uh, ethical rules here, which um, I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't have any, but my, my point is, it is a question of really looking into the regulations for product design and product deployment that is probably um, that probably has to happen. Yeah, we have these regulations in automotive, in aerospace, in pharmaceutical industries, and maybe we will have to have that for information systems as well, which we currently have with very weak data protection laws, um, but with artificial agents, it becomes uh, more difficult. Another aspect that I would like to comment on, and which I think is typically, it's typically overlooked, is the fact that we fear what we perceive as aggressive. Yeah, so we, we, if you look at Terminator, it looks aggressive. But what about, what about the friendly technologies that turn us into slaves yeah, the friendly enslavement, enslavement that comes from viral technologies. And I would take the mobile phone already. Yeah, so everybody fears that at one time we will be dominated by machines. And if you look at the dependency on mobile phones, you could say this is already happening now. Yeah, only that we are not giving it away. <laughs> yeah, we're using it and we, we don't fear the technology. And, um, but there we have actually a very concrete problem with our kids growing up and they're spending too much time in front of these devices. And there is no way to, nobody's actually arguing to, to put restrictions on it. Yeah, it's, I think the friendly enslavement is something that, that is much more dangerous than the aggressive one, because the aggressive one will be regulated one way or the other, but the other one is something that is usually subversive and we don't notice it so much. And the final comment is, it's again, it, it's again about this, um, this deception, the brain-body mismatch, as Ellen called it. Um, I find this a very, very difficult point, because machines that look like humans and uh, hide their machine character. They have already now a huge number of useful applications. We see them in movies. We see them in shopping windows. We see them in medical research like autism research where humanoid robots are actually quite powerful tools. Yeah, so again, one will probably end up with an with a ethical law for the robots here that will have a, a back door that everybody will just take, yeah? So it will sound something like, you shouldn't have a deceptive robot <clears throat> unless it is useful. And then we are back at uh, square one again. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. So, I, I, so yeah, just to wrap it up, I see that Alan is getting the gear to contradict me on all my points because he has thought about it much longer than I have. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I think the, the, interesting, uh, the interesting aspect here is that there is so much usefulness um, that it is almost overshadowing the, the fears that there are. And uh, my point is that one has to look much closer into the stages of product design and product deployment rather than the research in itself, because the research is typically broad or it has beneficiary, at least if we talk about publicly funded research, or it has beneficiary uh, motives. Yeah? But where it becomes difficult is when you have companies picking up these pieces and um, doing something evil. Yeah? And then, of course, all good intentions are lost if the evil is financed by the highest governmental authorities. So here we, we are not talking about a robotics problem. Here we are talking about a general technology problem that, that goes into bio uh, life science as well as it goes into robotics or anything else. Okay, so I'm done here with my commentary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, Oliver. Uh, yes, of course, I would like to let Alan Winfield uh, give the first reaction. Thank you. Um, uh, so can you hear me? Yeah. Perfectly, yeah. 
Great. So, no, uh, thank you very much, Mark Oliver. Very, very interesting uh, comments there. And, um, and uh, no, you, you may be uh, surprised that I, I agree with almost everything. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take your points kind of um, uh, almost in reverse order. So, uh, so yes, you're absolutely right that friendly enslave, enslavement is something that, that, that's happened already. It's, you know, it's, it, we're already slaves to our technology. Um, but that doesn't mean that we should not be, uh, 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 at the very least, aware of this and mindful of, of that phenomenon. Um, the, uh, the, your, your point about um, uh, what is a robot, I think, is extremely, it's an extremely good point. It's very difficult to uh, you know, take five roboticists and you, you get five different definitions of robot. Um, my, I have to say my favorite definition uh, is almost the simplest, which is that a robot is simply an embodied artificial intelligence. Um, that's kind of simple, but, uh, but it, is, it is tricky. The problem is that, that the word robot tends to be used um, uh, particularly for things that are at the research stage. And then once they become uh, products, uh, once they get into the real world, we stop calling them robots. We call them things instead like driverless cars or, um, or drones, uh, for instance. Um, and and uh, you know, in a sense, the word robot disappears. Um, but, but yes, that is a very difficult uh, definition. Um, I mean, I prefer a, a, a rather tougher definition, which actually talks about um, um, machines that can both sense their environment and then um, uh, purposefully, so that the, pur purposeful, the purposefulness uh, is a consequence of the AI, uh, act or um, react to that environment, act within that, uh, kind of act on the environment, if you like. And in the environment. Um, so, in fact, I have a, 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 a section on what is a robot in in my uh, introduction to robotics, which uh, uh, covers these these different definitions. None of them, in the end, are uh, particularly satisfactory for exactly the reasons that, that uh, Mark Oliver um, rehearsed. Um, but then I think the big point that uh, that you made, which I, I want to to reply to, is the the question of um, I suppose what you're really saying is that we need to be pragmatic about um, uh, you know ethics and and the first thing you said was at the beginning different ethics at different stages of the process. I have to say that I I disagree really quite strongly with that. I think that we should have a single set of principles that apply to the whole of the process. But I think that the ethics uh, should be then underpinned um, and, if you like, uh, not just underpinned, but strengthened by uh, standards which would apply at the product development stage and then legislation, which, would, of course, would apply at the, the product deployment stage. And, um, and that gives me an opportunity to tell you that I'm uh, currently part of a, a British Standards Institute working group, and we are, in fact, drafting a new standard on uh, robot ethics. It's, uh, it's called BS8611. It has a number, um, and uh, it's, it's a long process. I don't know yet whether it really will become a published standard because uh, it's, a, it's a quite a long process of of, of committee work and, and step, several stages of public co consultation. But it seems to be very, very important that if there are published standards, uh, then uh, companies are more likely to say, well, our product complies to BS8611 because it, it's a kind of, uh, um, it, it lends, uh, if you like, a cachet uh, of quality uh, to that product. But of course, standards have to have teeth. Uh, and I think that legislation is also important um, uh, to, if you like, to make sure that things that we believe are uh, wrong. Um, I mean, a very good example of, of, of such a legislation is 
uh, seat belts in 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 cars um, uh, initially or when I was a boy uh, you didn't have to wear a seat belt and in fact uh, car manufacturers uh, could sell uh, cars quite legally that were not fitted with seat belts uh, society decided that was not a good idea uh, too many people were dying uh, as a result of not wearing seat belts uh, and so it became illegal for companies to sell cars uh, that were not fitted with seat belts, and quite rightly so. And I think that the same should happen in robotics and artificial intelligence. We need to have a flow from uh, ethics through to standards and ultimately into legislation. Uh, so um, I, I, that's probably not a complete answer, but uh, I hope that will suffice. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark Oliver? If you yeah. wish to reply. Yeah, I, w I would like to, to uh, reply to one point that Ellen, or one comment that Ellen made, and may, maybe I uh, mis-express uh, myself. So um, it is about this point of different stages and to be pragmatic. So what I mean is the following. I don't mean that we did need a different set of ethics. What I mean is we need a different set of ethical procedures to deal with the contentious, to, to deal with the different problems, because as you as you rightly point out, standards or, or ethical rules they are always very general, and if you are in a concrete situation, you will always find these weasel phrases that will help you to do it anyway. Yeah. yeah. And. I'm again. I'm, I'm speaking very pragmat pragmatic here. Yeah, if you are sitting in a, in a committee where you have the people from all the various stakeholders in there, they will make sure that whatever they have a financial or other interest in will still be possible under um, these rules. So the only solution that you have is that when you actually talk about concrete technological steps that you are applying more stringent rules, which are of course conformant with the general, with the general principles. So it's the same set of ethical principles, mm -hmm. yeah? but you apply more stringent rules and procedures in order to get a product approved or a product funded or whatever. Yeah? It's basically what you do in, in uh, pharmaceutical research. Yeah? You have clear rules, clear ethical rules about pharmaceuticals that are established and they are valid throughout the entire process. But if you want to develop a new drug, you have more stringent rules that apply here, yeah, because you are, you are um, affecting a certain group of people. And if you're in the testing stage, you're allowed to do things that you are not allowed anymore if you go into a larger field study. Yeah? And it's even stronger if you bring it to the market because then potentially millions of people are affected. So you have a set of different um, ethically motivated procedures which will guide you through the stages of product development and product um, certification. Yeah? This is what I meant. Thank you. That uh, that makes perfect sense. So uh, yes, I absolutely agree with you. Thank you very much, both of you. If it's okay, I would like to skip uh, to the audience questions because we have uh, three questions at least waiting from the audience members who've been listening so far. So the first question is from uh, David uh, Benke. You have to read it out. Uh, and I have to read it. So um, the question is: uh, Bernd Stahl mentioned science fiction scenarios. So I'm interested in the notion of public imaginaries around artificial intelligence and intelligent machines. To which extent do these narratives and myths shape our understanding? They often come up when communicating research to the public, but do they also influence the research itself? So I'm guessing this is a question to Bernd, and but I, if anyone is, is invited to, to come comment. Bernd, would you like to comment? Was that to me, Ben? I think it could be. It, it, you mentioned the science fiction scenario, so David is interested in uh, in, in which ways uh, public imaginaries, narratives, and myths 
shape our understanding uh, of the world because they always come up, you know, when we communicate research to the public. Do they also influence the research, do you think? Well, yeah, yes, I think I think it does, or they do. Uh, and I think that there are studies that show that um, technologists tend to uh, be aware of them. And we've heard lots of references today already from Asimov to the Terminator. Um, but we're going to talk about this. Um, and, and having talked to people in the HPP, in particular to the roboticists, I know that they're very interested in this sort of uh, question, ethical issues around robotics. And I think a lot of this interest is stimulated um, by, by public um, or general literature, science fiction, and so on. Ellen and, and Mark Oliver, do you have an, an, a feeling about the influence of science fiction scenarios and myths uh, and in, in research on? I think this is a this is a self perpetuating circle in a way. Yeah. So the um, the idea of of robots is uh, is very old. Yeah. And um, we have the golem. We even have this chess playing Turk that was uh, in the I don't know 17th century. And these stories are always revolving. And and I think they go back to biblical times in the end. Yeah. And that's, that's, I think, also a reason and why we have this cultural difference between the Western and the Eastern cultures when it comes to the perception of robots, because we have a, quite a long history of thinking about these, these machines, and mostly from a, from an, uh, from a dangerous perspective. Yeah, so you have to really look hard for the, for the robot stories where you have the big beneficial or beneficiary robot going around doing good. Yeah, there is no Mother Teresa robot, but there is a Terminator. Yeah, and it's it is a body of this literature that shapes, I would say, our perception. And of course, roboticists they grow up with this. There are many people that say I went into robotics because I read Asimov. Um, and 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 then the circle closes itself. Yeah, so. Oh, I think um, it's almost it's almost trivial to ask whether it has an influence. Of course, it does. Yes, I absolutely agree. Um, it's a profound influence, uh, and uh, it, I mean, for roboticists, as as you say, Mark Oliver, quite rightly, it's it's absolutely part of the culture. Um, although we, you know, we need to, I, I do remind younger roboticists that we need to try and separate, you know, mythology from, from fact um, or from, you know, uh, uh, reasonable um, uh, conjecture. Um, and incidentally, I, I, let me just um, say that, that uh, uh, as far as I'm, I, I'm aware, the first mention of, of any kind of AI related thing is, is Aristotle, 300 BC. Um, and he, even he refers to uh, uh, to Homer, uh, so uh, a really very very long history indeed. But when it comes to the public, um, uh, as a science communicator, um, I I've had a problem for years in the sense that many many people think that a surprising number of people think that the robots that they see in the movies are real. Uh, and therefore, we, you know, as 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 communicators, public engagers in robotics and AI, uh, we have to overcome that barrier and and really try and uh, make sure that, that as many people as, as possible understand uh, what real robots are, are, are like, uh, and that they are absolutely, mostly, uh, thankfully, mostly not uh, like the ones in the movies. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you very much for this answer. Thank you, Mark Oliver, as well, and Bern. Uh, I have one question from Christine Aikali. Christine? Christine, can you hear us? Can you ask your question? Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, this is brilliant then. I'm going to be able to ask my question. So, um, Peter um, mentioned earlier the issues that are caused by uh, the distortion between both long-term and short-term perceptions of intelligent machines and robots. And uh, I I've been listening uh, from the beginning of the presentations and com comments, and uh, it struck me that um, maybe one of the problems is that we always tend to talk about these technologies in terms of 
individual machines, which is probably very anthropomorphic on our part. And maybe we do not think enough about them uh, in terms of network and heterogeneous and distributed human and machines and institutional systems as well. And I was wondering whether uh, the various speakers so far could say something about about this particular issue and how uh, us as social scientists engaged in trying to do some foresight work, we may try to address the complexities of such a systemic approach to, uh, I mean, a higher level approach to the, uh, these network systems. Thank you, Christine. May I uh, speak very quickly? Um, yeah. I think, Christine, you're absolutely 100% correct. Um, all real, all practical robot systems are in fact um, closely integrated with humans um, and, uh, you know, therefore, um, well, I'll give you an example. I, I was leading a, a, an outdoor robotics competition uh, less than two weeks ago in Italy uh, and, uh, and very, very um, uh, deliberately, the, the competition was not between the robots, it was between the robot human teams because the team working where robot, robots and humans are, are, are together, working together is critical to that search and rescue uh, scenario. So I think you're absolutely right. And, and, and uh, you know, the kind of the research you, you mentioned is really very badly needed uh, in, um, in, the, uh, in the dynamics of, of the human robot uh, team working and collective and environment. Is that um, so this is Peter. Uh, yeah, I agree with Alan and, and Christina. That's absolutely correct. And I think we very often focus too much on the individual robot, um, whether that's drones. That people think, oh, these terrible drones, but it's really the policy under which those are used and how they're being used uh, mm. in this particular uh, case. Or in the case of you know robots creating unemployment, they're like, well, this robot's replacing me and taking my job. Um, but there's these deeper processes about labor and capital and how these are interacting and how capitalism functions to de-skill and make work precarious. And that in some leads to um, mass unemployment and disparities of wealth that are really the underlying problem is about how wealth is distributed in the system, not the robot or the machine, but that's been sort of easy thing to point at and demonize. Um, so yeah, I think that's absolutely right. We have to think about these larger processes. Okay, I have one final question uh, that I think we can just manage before uh, we end at 12 o'clock. It's from uh, uh, Professor Nicholas Rose. It's about the uh, moral ag agency of robots. It's addressed to you, Ellen. Um, can or could robots never be responsible moral agents? You say they cannot, uh, but only that, or only that they are not. But uh, does it mean that they should not be moral agents? And, and why do you think? That's a great question. Um, well, the, our ethical principles were written to be applicable right now uh, with, you know, the as it were, the, the, within the limitations of current robot technology or AI technology. Um, uh, yes, I, you know, I think that in principle, uh, robots might eventually, eventually, I say, you know, and, and what I mean by that is a very long time into the future, uh, be, um, uh, become morally responsible agents. Um, how long? Well, uh, take a guess, uh, several hundred years in my view. Um, uh, the point is that, that you know, we simply, uh, the, 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 the level of, of current uh, artificial intelligence research, or the, the, uh, the, the problem is we don't know how to build um, the AI that will uh, allow robots to be um, self-aware, sentient, self-reflective, have the kind of uh, of human equivalent consciousness um, uh, intelligence that, that, that we all uh, enjoy and, and share. Um, and until robots have all of that, uh, then they cannot, in my view, be um, responsible for their own actions. So, so uh, you know, I, I think that those things are in principle possible. 
Uh, not everyone agrees, but I think they are in principle possible, um, but, uh, but will not happen for a very long time. And as Stuart Russell said in a recent meeting, uh, there are some very, very large uh, major breakthroughs that, that, we, that need to be um, invented, if you like, need to be discovered in uh, robotics and artificial intelligence. And we don't even know what those major breakthroughs are. They're kind of unknown breakthroughs that have to be uh, broken through uh, before we can get to that point. Are there anyone who would like to comment on this last answer by Ellen? Otherwise, uh, I would like to thank everyone, uh, all the speakers, the commentators, the audience, and uh, like.